In one of my previous guide videos, we looked at all the different creatures and biomes in the caves and what you can expect to find down there in the dark. If you haven't seen that video, I recommend watching that before jumping into this one as I'll skim through some of the things I mentioned in there already. In fact, I wasn't sure if I should even call this a beginner's guide because what you'll most likely encounter in the ruins and beyond is something that even experienced players in the game can still get caught out by from time to time. But on the other hand, the only real way to get good at this kind of thing is to go out there and experience it for yourself. So in this video, I'll be telling you everything that you need to know about the ruins and the rest is up to you. If you are planning a trip down to the ruins, you'll obviously require some gear in the form of lighting. And while it's definitely possible to go in with a lantern or miner hat, I personally don't feel comfortable without moggles on me, at least for something to switch to every now and then for that extra visibility. Having decent weaponry is also a must for the ruins. Dark swords are good and hand bats are probably even better since they have a greater durability and you're not going to run out of things to fight down there, let's be honest. Be sure to pack some armor as well and be wary of which slot you're bringing. If you're going to be using your head slot for light, then taking a football helmet might not be the best option and something like a log suit might be preferable. And as is the case with caves, having a source of food, sanity and HP is greatly recommended for the ruins as well. And while this seems like the kind of preparation you'd need for a boss fight, as you enter into the wilds and the village biomes, which lead into the ruins, you'll quickly see that it is 100% justified. The main threat here, besides the occasional depth worm, is the swarm of Splamunkies. Like several aspects of the ruins and atrium beyond, Splamunkies are affected by the nightmare cycle, which constantly shifts between periods of calm and periods of anything but calm. And during the calm phase, these monkeys operate just like you'd expect if you've ever played Shipwrecked. They'll follow you around, pick up items off the floor, wear your hats, steal from Hutch and fling poop at you if you attack any of them. Just overall harassing and annoying you. During the nightmare phase however, they transform into their shadow counterparts which target you on sight and often in large numbers too. These guys will chase you to the ends of the earth or until the calm phase resumes in roughly 3-4 to four minutes. In small numbers though, the Shadow Spill Monkeys are much easier to kill than the regular version as they only use their melee attack and are very predictable as a result. It's when you get the whole squad of them chasing you that you have a problem though, so try to keep the nightmare cycle in the back of your mind as you head through these areas. Look out for the warning sounds which mean that the cycle is about to start and either time your run to avoid the nightmare phase or make sure that you're well clear of the majority of the monkeys if you do plan on making a mad dash through there. The stage of the nightmare cycle also has an effect on nightmare fishes, which are prevalent in the wilds as well. During the nightmare phase of the cycle, these fishes will open and spawn nightmare creatures which will target you if you get too close. Unlike regular nightmare creatures that only attack you when your sanity is low, these guys will come after you regardless, so unless you want to collect some of that sweet nightmare fuel, I'd suggest keeping them at a distance. Slurpers can also be found in the wilds and village biomes, and while they are fairly easy to kill or just ignore completely, if you're not careful, they will attach themselves to your face and slurp all your hunger away. So obviously you don't want to let them do that, but if you do find yourself with a slurper for a face, you can just unequip them like you would a hat. And make sure to pick up the hat that falls on the floor before anyone gets to it. You really don't want a Splamonkey running away with your moggles. There are also some dangling depth dwellers here in the ruins, but as long as you stay out of their web, these spiders really won't be posing you any problems at all. And you might even be able to use them as a distraction if you have some monkeys or depth worms chasing after you. And speaking of depth worms, moguls don't last forever, so fighting some to gather a few glow berries is a very good idea. So, got all that so far? This was just about the entrance to the ruins by the way, we haven't even made it into the proper ruins yet. And if you're getting a bit low on some of your vitals at this point, now is probably a good time to take a breather and get ready for what's ahead. Make sure that you still have enough food to keep you going and light as well as you probably won't be finding a whole lot of that from here on out. You can collect some bananas if you need to from the village area growing on decayed banana trees or from dead splamunkies. 
Hopefully you won't have lost too much health in the opening areas as the rest will most likely be a lot more difficult. The ruins itself is made up of a few different biomes, namely the labyrinth, military and sacred biomes, and these are connected by thin pathways and interspersed with different chambers. For the most part, the military and sacred biomes are very similar. You encounter the same creatures, they're more or less mingled together anyway, and the main difference is the runic turf in the sacred biomes which lights up corresponding with the nightmare cycle. You can even use this to help you time your run back through the village and the wilds when the turf darkens again. These biomes also contain most of the valuable loot, which is why we made this damn trip in the first place. We've got statues that you can mine down for precious gems, nightmare fuel and thulacite, broken clockwork you can hammer for gears and trinkets, and the ancient pseudoscience station to combine them all into some of the best items in the game. Unfortunately, this isn't like a candy shop. You can't just go around picking up all the good loot and be on your way. Each biome and each chamber will undoubtedly have some creatures defending the goodies and the main enemy here is the damaged clockworks. They function more or less like the clockwork pieces on the surface. They have the same amount of health, do the same amount of damage and will drop a combination of nightmare fuel, thulacite fragments, gears and purple gems for the bishop. This place is practically infested with these guys though, which is good if you're playing as WX and not so good if you're playing as anybody else. In fact, this is probably a good time for my weekly reminder that WX is, again, the best character for this situation and not only benefits from the gears you find, gaining a major boost to all stats when eating one, but if you manage to have an overcharged WX, you can really easily get out of a tight spot you can practically run through the wilds and village biomes without a care in the world. You don't need to worry so much about lighting and it makes fighting the creatures down here just so much easier. So if you're planning on giving the ruins a go for the first time, I highly recommend switching over to WX. But even if you are playing as my good old robot buddy, you're going to need to learn how to fight these clockworks if you want to return with anything or if you want to return at all. The knight can be kited by dodging after every two hits, and you can get an extra few hits every time it does its little charging animation. The bishop is a bit more difficult to dodge, and without a decent speed boost, your best option is probably just to tank it with some armor on. The rook is also a bit trickier to kite as it likes to charge at you and can be a bit less predictable in its movements, and I personally will just tank it as well. However, if you're clever about it, you can use the rooks to clear out the broken and damaged clockworks around the place, since they will destroy objects and damage creatures that they run into. You can also create your own friendly clockwork by putting three gears into one of the broken piles, but this usually ends up being a waste of gears, and while you might want a friendly rook, you usually end up with a knight or bishop that dies very quickly instead. So, you've been battling the clockworks, you've fought back the nightmare creatures and collected some good loot along the way, now's the time to bring them to the ancient pseudoscience station. And you'll probably notice that there are several of these stations scattered throughout the military and sacred biomes. The broken stations however offer only half of the recipes in the ancient tab compared to the complete one. There is always one complete pseudoscience station in its own chamber, so you can hammer down the others if you wish. While there is a greater chance that enemies will spawn as a result, there is a chance that you might get some very valuable items instead, not to mention the thulacite from the station itself. And I mentioned that there is always one complete station, and it's easy to recognize this one as it's surrounded by nightmare lights. These lights function in the same way as the nightmare fishes, spawning nightmare creatures when in the nightmare phase of the cycle. The light will also greatly reduce your sanity when nearby, and due to the constant spawning of creatures from these lights, I'd recommend doing the bulk of your crafting from this station when in the calm phase of the nightmare cycle. This pseudoscience station is also usually guarded by a few damaged bishops that you'll need to take care of and has an ancient chest nearby which you can use for the Metheus puzzle if you haven't completed that already. As for the items you should craft from the ancient pseudoscience station, definitely convert all your thulacite fragments into thulacite for starters, 
And the next thing you should do is make a construction amulet. This halves the construction cost of all recipes when worn, and seeing as Ruin's loot is relatively hard to obtain, and even after clearing its entirety, you still might not have many of the rarer gems, it's recommended that you use the amulet to craft most of the other stuff in the ancient tab, especially those that require gems like the Magaluminescence, Starcaller Staff, Deconstruction Staff, and Lazy Explorer, which are all very useful items. The Magaluminescence grants you a 20% speed boost when worn, as well as providing you a small source of light and sanity. The Starcaller Staff can be used to create dwarf stars that last 3.5 in-game days, and provide a large amount of light, heat and sanity if you stand underneath it, making it very useful for boss fights in particular. This staff can also be placed in the Moonstone on a full moon to give you the Mooncaller staff instead. The Deconstruction staff is essentially the opposite of the Construction Amulet and can be used to deconstruct items while returning 100% of the resources. This comes in handy for items such as pan flutes which are difficult to obtain and items that you might want to duplicate such as scales and shroom skin. The lazy explorer is also quite handy as it grants you a short range teleportation, useful in some boss fights and when finding and traversing the atrium. These are really the main items that you should look to craft and in combination with the thalassite armor and clubs that you can make you'll very quickly find that your inventory may be lacking a bit of space. It's a fantastic idea to bring along some bundling wrap if you have some available, otherwise you may have to make some return trips. A lot of these items require living logs as well as some other ingredients that you may be lacking, so return trips may be necessary anyway. In any case, it makes sense to keep most of the crafting ingredients like gems and thulacite that go unused nearby to the station, as most of them can only be used in the ancient tab anyway, and this should save you a fair bit of space in your backpack when bringing items back from the ruins. And aside from the valuable loot, there is another purpose to the ruins and beyond, and the key to that is hidden deep inside the labyrinth, which is a maze of pathways and dead ends sprinkled with ornate chests and dangling death dwellers, and culminating in the lair of the ancient guardian. The entrance into the labyrinth is easily distinguished as there's usually a patch of mud turf with light flowers and a path leading in, and despite appearances there isn't too much to be feared from the labyrinth itself. The spiders won't come out unless you step on the webs, and you can walk along the boundary of the path to avoid that. Some decent loot can be found in the ornate chests as well, often providing you a top up of armour occasionally dropping a few spiders on you instead, or lowering your sanity. As for the Ancient Guardian itself, it's quite easy to kill with a group of people and can even get confused when multiple people are hitting it at the same time. If you're playing solo, you can fight from behind one of these indestructible pillars where the Guardian can't hit back. It's a bit of a cheesy method, I'll admit, and you can of course fight it head on, but it requires a great deal of dodging in between every few hits, and as a result takes quite a while to dwindle its health all the way down from 10,000 to zero. The large ornate chest that you get as a result will give you various items and ingredients from the ancient tab, so it may even be worth doing this before crafting your items in case you get something you wanted for free. You'll also receive the ancient key which you'll need to summon Fuel Weaver in the atrium, and unfortunately that is going to have to be a video for another time. I did plan on speaking about the atrium and fuel weaver in this video, but I didn't expect it to be this long already. And honestly, while this kind of content is tenuously a beginner's video, the atrium and fuel weaver is definitely not beginner's content, so having them separate will let me cover it in a different context. I hope you did find this video helpful and enjoyable. As always, let me know in the comments what other aspects of the game you're struggling with and I'll consider covering it in the future. If you have some of your own tips and tricks for the ruins, leave them down below as well. You never know who might stumble onto it and find it really helpful. Thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to follow my Twitch channel if you'd like to see me play live or even join in and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.